It is just a huge honor for me today to be podcast interviewing Dr. Daryl Holmes, BDS, OBE, AICD. He's the founder, owner of 1300 Smiles in Australia. We both graduated the same year, 1987. Uh, he's from the University of Queensland in Brisbane. Uh, we both have four boys, but he has he had a daughter than four boys. Ryan, you were supposed to be a girl. I want you to know that. Um, having obtained a Royal Australia Air Force undergraduate scholarship for his final two years of UQ Dental School, Dr. Daryl Holmes commenced his career as a dental officer in the RAAF in Adelaide, South Australia, in 1988, then was fortunate enough to work not only in Australia, but in the United Kingdom until 1991. Daryl started private practice in a partnership in 1991 in the small towns of Ayr and Home Hill, North Queensland, near Townsville, before establishing Townsville Family Dentistry in 1999 with three practices throughout Townsville. After many practice acquisitions and mergers, Townsville Family Dentist became 1300 Smiles in 2004 before being listed on the Australian Stock Exchange in March 2005 with over 20 dentists across six practices in Townsville and one in Cairns. Today, 1300 Smiles has a total of 26 practices over 100 dentists, 300 plus staff, all along the eastern southern coast of Queensland, uh, New South Wales, Adelaide, and South Australia. In 2010, Daryl and 1300 Smiles became involved in YWAM Medical Ships, something he is still heavily involved in today, donating his time and expertise to voluntarily provide much-needed dental care, training, and mentoring of many Papua New Guinea dentists and healthcare workers in remote areas and villages. Daryl was recently awarded an Order of the British Empire, OBE, for his involvement and efforts with YWAM Medical Ships delivering dental care and training in PNG. I watched your YouTube videos of that. I want to tell the listeners that um, I know Daryl is humble and shy, and he's in Australia, but I'm telling you, um, he was the first publicly traded dental office, one 300 smiles in Australia, and today, I've gone around the world so many times, lectured in 50 countries. It's basically only one 300 smiles, and then later came in Australia, Pacific Smile. And then you have a, um, you have a uh, Q&M. Uh, we podcasted uh, the Q&M guy in, uh, was number 373. And we... Um, Podcast 841 was the other guy, Pacific Smiles Group, with the founder, Dr. Alex Abrams. But man, Daryl, you, um, there is not one publicly traded dental company in America. I don't think any of them could go public. When you and I got out of school, Orthodontic Centers of America was the only one that ever made it to the New York Stock Exchange. And there was about a dozen on NASDAQ. They've all imploded. They're all gone. Right now, all these... Uh, Chains, when they want to unload debt, they um, they basically, or private equity, um, you are so well ran that you can go publicly traded, and you were the first one. So, I mean, you are an amazing man. Tell us about your journey. Um, how are you doing today? Great, Howard. Nice to be talking and uh, listening to a bit of that history of things. It seems like a long time ago that a lot of this stuff was happening, and the listing, and dental school and all those things, those early years. But look, um, dentistry's been a great journey for me. It was something that I always thought needed leverage. Um, the one and two man dental practice, man, woman dental practices of the past, I believe are the past because they're just too small, not efficient enough, and they don't cover illnesses, holidays, absences, and lifestyle and family concerns adequately. So. The concept of having group practice and multiple group practices managed centrally so the dentists and staff can focus on patient care and the delivery of quality, um, patient-centric dental care without the hassles of admin and IT and marketing and financial reporting and compliance and all that other stuff, apart from the, the obvious compliance of infection control and so on. If you can centralise all the rest of it, allow the dentists and the staff at practice level to to meet, greet, and treat the patients very well, to the best of their ability, then we found that it's a it's a model that works well, and we build in locums and toothaches and emergencies and time off and holidays and family time. So we found it works well, and our success today is obvious and measurable and quantifiable on 
old metrics. Well, you and I are about the same age. Um, we're in our early 50s. Um, do you think our generation that graduated in 87 were more, those baby boomers were hardwired to want to own their own office, which is, like you say, it's a lifestyle. When you own your own office, it's not a Monday through Friday, eight to five job. You wear so many hats. You got to be a leader, advertising, marketing, HR, legal, accounting, finance, manager accounting, and they wore all those hats. Do you think the millennials that are graduating now that were born after 1980, do you think they're more likely to be uh, a work-life balance where they just want to work for you Monday through Friday and not um, have being a dentist a lifestyle where they just have to eat, live, breathe, die, and sleep their business around the clock every day the rest of their life? You said it. I think you described it perfectly, how things have changed. Millennials are a very different breed and the generation that we X gen baby boomers sort of don't quite understand as fully as we probably should. But yeah, they have a lifestyle. I need it now. They want to travel. They want to, you know, work and play and recreate and do whatever they want to do. And that that many hats and your courses, however, that I've done several times over the years, the one day MBA, etc. Um, it's all about wearing those so many hats, and there are just almost too many hats to run your own business and um, and do good things. You know, and keep your practice going and answer those after hours calls and Mrs. Smith and little Johnny's and, you know, broken the teeth in the footy game or in the swimming pool or whatever. And you're really on call 24 seven and you've got to wear so many hats and dentists in general aren't cut out to wear and be good at all those other things. They're great at dentistry in general and a few other areas, but not all of them. So, yeah, I think it's a it's a model now for the newer generation as well as some of the old time, older dentists like us and older who just get sick of all that admin and all that responsibility and would rather, you know, just sit back and do the dentistry three, four days a week, X number of weeks a year, whatever they want to do. We've got a lot of lifestyle and sea change dentists taking that option of just working in a, a managed back end managed practice and just worrying about the front end, the patients and the dentistry. Well, there's so many ways, there's so much evidence that what you just said, what we're both saying is true. I mean, look at birth rates. I mean, my mom and dad had seven kids. You, I had four, you had five. Millennials are waiting almost a decade later than their parents to get married. And then they only have what, it, what uh, you know, like a, a, they think a third of millennials will have no kids. A third will probably have one and a third might have two. Whereas I had four boys in 60 months and you had five. So it looks, looks like they're kind of cutting back on work, babies, all that stuff to, to do more traveling and work-life balance, right? It certainly seems that way. And, you know, I don't think it's finished yet. I think even the guys, guys and girls are in dental school nowadays and our new graduates coming out, we're just seeing every year we tend to take on, you know, six, eight, 10, 12 new graduates at least across our group. And we're, aiming to take on more because I think it's it's great to learn more about these guys and it is a it's a moving feast it's a very dynamic generation and keeps evolving because there's just more technology more things to do more areas of interest they just seem to be focused and keen to to do a lot more to some extent than uh, we did in our day and some of our older folk so yeah it's exciting times but we've got to go with those times and we've got to adapt to technology and their needs and wants and um, you know I think they're, they're great a lot of their attitudes are great you know for the three or four days a week or the or the 40 weeks a year that you can get them or that the you know whatever number of days of the week or hours of the week they want to work and other times they're just recreating and doing other things that wasn't really in our DNA but it's certainly inbuilt and hardwired into them. I know my boys tell me at least three times a week, Dad, you never have to work another day in your life. Why do you work 12 hours a day, seven days a week? And it's like, dude, that's all I know. Um, what, <laughs> how, what was the percent of girls in your class in, um, when you graduated in 87 in Australia versus today in a graduating class? Sorry, that was number of girls, women? Yeah, what, what percent of your class in 87 was women and what percent of the graduates are yeah. women today? Well, I believe it, in most of the dental schools in Australia, you know, it's doubled the number of dental schools in the last five or six years. So uh, there's a lot more graduates. And I believe the stats are just over 50%, somewhere between 50, 55, 
even approaching 60%, I think, in some of the university graduating classes. So, and back in my well, day, was it was more like 40%, 40, 35 to 45% females. So that's not and a big change. No, so, so it's not, not dramatic. No. Um, yeah, because what the reason I was asking that is since women dentists marry smart, women dentists are always married to male dentists, physicians, lawyers, whereas male dentists... Um, always try to marry the, the prettiest girl in a pair of Levi's. Uh, so, so the women dentists, it's always huge double income, whereas the male dentists, a lot of times their spouse doesn't work. Um, in America, the 35 corporate dental chains that have 50 or more locations, two out of every three of their dentist associates are women. Do you find that in one 300 smiles that two out of three of your dentists are women? No, it's not that high. Um, uh, offhand, I couldn't tell you exactly, but I think it's more like 50-50. So I think it's okay, so that's not a part of your secret sauce? No. What, 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 um, what is your secret sauce? If someone said, what is your business model that a publicly traded corporate 1300 Smiles is doing that the average mom-and-pop dental office isn't doing – um, is it more explained in hours, convenience, availability? Like, what are your do, do all your offices have the same hours? No, it's not as regimented as that. Broadly, we we work on a AAA rating or policy. We talk about availability, accessibility, and affordability of dental care, and we describe our model as owning, operating, and optimizing dental practices. So there are three O's and our three A's or triple A rating. So I suppose in essence, we try and compare to a ma and pop or you know, two dentists or a solo dentist operating, they've got to spend whatever number of hours wearing all those different hats uh, on a weekly basis, daily and weekly basis. So if they don't have to do that, someone else manages all of that and especially trained, you know, have a hat for each person, you know, accounting, HR, IT, marketing, financial reporting, compliance, and so on. So if someone does all of that for them, ultimately they can either work some extra hours dentally, earning more money, or choose to recreate, relax, or family, friends, and recreation, leisure activities. So I think that's ultimately it. You choose whether you want to earn more money or recreate and relax more or play more sport or whatever it might be, versus doing it all yourself and having that ultimate control, which a lot of dentists are hardwired to, to do and want to be in control and manage all those processes. Yeah, most, I mean, we're homo sapien animal. Most apes are controlling. I mean, they're just, that's part of being homo sapien. And, uh, um, but so when you talk about availability and accessibility, what is your corporate advantage? Are you more available in hours? Are you more accessible in the schedule? Are you more affordable? Are your prices lower? Go through your three A's on, and what is your unique selling proposition um, on those three A's? Yeah, it's not just those three A's, but they are certainly a core of our business and our model. Um, availability of hours and accessibility, there's just many definitions of those, both those terms and words. Um, we try and ex offer a range of hours. We, we ideally want to offer more than eight hours a day and more than the nine to five traditionally because, let's face it, most people work or are at school or committed during those hours. So we work on the trying to be able to offer more like 8 a.m. to 8 p.m. type hours. If we can get that five or six days a week, ideally we want to offer some weekend hours as well because, again, a lot of people work Monday to Friday, so Saturday is free. Others have sport and other pursuits on a Saturday. So if we can offer a, a six day and in some cases seven days a week opening hours and accessibility, you know, higher profile, you I know talk about, you know, a high profile, busy street corner position for your practice, you know, in a shopping center precinct sort of thing. We want to be visible. We want people to know that a dental practice is at this location and there and here. So we work on sort of big signage, big street frontage, all our shop fronts are labelled and branded and big graphic images of male, female, adults, kids, and sort of the, with some paraphernalia and some 
come on in sort of thing, some appeal. So knowing where your dentist is, if you keep top of mind, hopefully getting those reticent and hesitant and sometimes nervous patients that we know about, getting them to know where your dentist is, hopefully come in and experience it with good parking, easy access, you know, wheelchair, disabled access, um, nice conditions, nice modern facilities. Our model is five, six, seven chair facilities so that there's always room for multiple dentists and particularly, you know, special interest dentists, maybe not specialists, but dentists who want to do different types of dental work. Um, so we provide all of that and affordability doesn't mean cheap. We provide a lot of um, any and all health funds, insurers, veteran affairs, government, outsourcing, public-private partnership things, private health insurances, and most of all, affordability, we try and work over payment terms and payment plans, which we're well known for, over a period of time. So people can either pay off their specific dental treatment plan over a period of months uh, on a direct debit type arrangement, or they can acquire a one or two or three or four or five thousand dollar dental care voucher which is again payable at their budget level 49 to 99 dollars per week so you can spread your dental payments and hence your dental care over a longer period of time you know i think this would be um i really like your um video on your one three hundred smiles dot com dot au uh, that explains all of this. It explains the $99 a week deal, which works out to about how much? What's $99 a week? What, what does that equal per year? Well, 50 week, 52 weeks a year, basically it's five grand. So for 99 bucks a week, 100, say 100 bucks a week for 50 weeks of the year, it's $5,000. So Yeah, but it just sounds so sweet. I mean, it's only $99 a week, and it just it just makes it seem like, well, I can do $99 a week. I mean, most people spend $99 a week just going out. Uh, for dinner and drinks after work. Um, would you care if we insert that video at the end of this podcast? Happy to, absolutely. Okay, yeah, I, I would have put that in there because, you know, when I saw your video, my first gut was to have it transcribed and do the video word for word for my dental office. I mean, that, that, that's how good <laughs> it was. I said, I said, I wonder what Daryl will think. I'm in, a, I'm in America. Uh, he, he might not ever figure out that I did that, but it was so well done. I think everybody should watch it. Um, by the way, what is one three hundred smiles? Is one is three hundred? What what's is it thirteen hundred or one three hundred? We say one three hundred. It's the same as basically the same as your one eight hundred, isn't it? Or is it one eight hundred yeah, in America? Yeah, that that's a free call. Yeah, so ours is the same in Australia. There is way up one eight hundred, but one three hundred is the next tranche or whatever. So it's the same as that. It's a free call, toll free. We, it's our name and our number is our tagline, so to speak. So it's one three hundred smiles. Think dental, think nice. toothache, think smile, think white, think accident, think dental care. One three hundred smiles. We just dial the number. And I also noticed that um, you know I've uh, about every five, probably every five years, going back to nineteen ninety, I flew from uh, Phoenix uh, to LA, then a sixteen hour flight, and I would lecture. In Brisbane, Sydney, Melbourne, Adelaide, Perth, jump over to New Zealand and do um, um, what's or, the or New Zealand? Yeah. But you're you're really far north of even Brisbane. I mean, you're in Townsville. That's that's almost to the great. Is that at the Great Barrier Reef? Absolutely. That's that's one of our claims to fame. Is Cairns, Townsville, Mackay. Yeah, that's all the, the Great Barrier Reef. So right so off our doorstep. You're 26, you have 26 locations, right? Yeah. But you're not in any of the major towns. You're, you're not in Sydney or Melbourne, right? We are in Sydney. We've now just recently purchased two orthodontic practices in Sydney. Uh, we've got three other practices in Sydney. So there's five practices of our 26 in Sydney, uh, one in Adelaide, which is the capital of South Australia. But no, we haven't uh, yet got into Melbourne. So yeah, and Brisbane, Adelaide. At- Adelaide is the uh, most conservative part of Australia. Would you agree with that? It is. I spent my first three years out of university in Adelaide, on and off in the Air Force, and uh, it's a city of churches. It's a very English, a lot of English uh, uh, settlers in Adelaide. When, it's when, a beautiful, yeah, when you, conservative when you lecture, city. When you lecture in the United States and Australia a lot, um, you can get pretty out there funny in California and New York, but you can't. <laughs> 
in Texas, Alabama, Mississippi. And when you're, if anybody listening to this, you're going to lecture in Australia, you can have a lot of fun and get crazy in Sydney and Melbourne, but not Adelaide. Adelaide, that's a city of churches and this, and uh, most of my jokes aren't funny in Adelaide. So it's very <laughs> conservative. But, but the, the question I was asking is, do demographics matter? Because you kind of got your start more in a rural area. Did you find it less competitive and more uh, lucrative to start out in Townsville? and Ad- I mean, you went into Adelaide before you went into Melbourne. And Melbourne and Sydney are both the same size. They're both about four and a half million people. In fact, Melbourne and Sydney alone is half the population of Australia. Um, it's about 20 million people. And there's about four and a half million in Sydney, four and a half Melbourne. So, so the question is, do demographics matter? Do your stores make better sense in rural areas where there's less dentists when you initially started back in the day? Yes, Howard, in short, uh, you're a man of economics and so on. It's simply the supply and demand curve or the, the scales of justice where there's supply and demand factors. In regional Queensland and regional Australia, in fact, there's always been less dentists and hence more patient demand. So less supply of dentists, more demand of patients in anywhere outside about an hour radius of a capital city, Brisbane, Sydney, Melbourne, Adelaide, Perth. So historically, it's balanced a bit more now due to more and more graduate dentists doubling our dental schools, importing lots of overseas dentists and so on. So there's now still, though, a maldistribution of dentists in the capital cities and within that, I call it the latte set or the Chardonnay set within an hour radius of a capital city and of GPO of a capital city. So regionally, yes, historically, there has been far more patient demand and the inability to attract or recruit dentists to those regional cities. And, you know, Brisbane, Sydney, Melbourne are big cities on the world scale, but there's a lot of regional cities and centres in Australia that are 50 to 100 to 200 to 50,000 people. Townsville's only 200,000 people. But that's where mainly you're located along the eastern seaboard on the coast. And, of course, Australia, as you know, the outback is hot and dry and very isolated. So we tend to base our model historically um, on the regional centres of 50 to 100,000 plus people with airports, good fishing, boating, recreational, um, you know, tea, coffee, cafes, theatre, and an airport, as I say, most importantly, to be able to fly back to Brisbane, Sydney, Melbourne, or off overseas for access. So dentists have to obviously have a certain level of comfort, and that's how we were able to then try and supply, recruit, and um, and place dentists into lots of these regional centres where often the demand was six to eight weeks for waiting lists for patients to get in and see a dentist. So if we could obviously supply more dentists, we could create a a much better supply chain to meet the demand of the patients and the dentistry that's needed in a cost-effective manner. And multiple operators in one centre in each of these regional cities was was one of our, and is still one of our key and core USPs and secrets to success. What is your mix of services? I, I mean, you say you bought two ortho practices in Sydney, three general dentists. Do all 26 of your uh, locations offer the same menu of services? Do you have specialists rotate or um, what? What, do you, what is your mix of services that you provide? Yeah, look, it's not McDonald's, it's not a franchise, and it's not, you know, the same fries and the same Coke and the same burger and, you know, mixed and made and done the same way, because, of course, that's just ridiculous in dentistry. All our dentists have clinical autonomy. They can do more or less of whatever it is that they have interest in. The best thing about multi-dentist practices and group practices, as you're well aware, is if you want to do more of something, you can easily refer, intra-office refer, the other things you don't want to do, I still practice half a day a week, but I haven't done endodontics for 15 odd years because I just thought, like you talk about various parts of dentistry, uh, you know, that's just something I didn't want to chase the fourth or the fifth root canal up in someone's seven or eighth tooth in the back of their mouth. I just wasn't ever particularly fond of it. So I refer all of that out. Lots of our dentists do more or less oral surgery. Some do implants, some do general dental um, orthodontics, 
Uh, we have bought now a couple of orthodontic practices. We haven't yet got them traveling around all our different practices. It is a potential plan along the way. We do have a couple of implant specialists and periodontists traveling and visiting several other different practices and getting in-house referrals. So yeah, it's there's no one size fits all. Um, lots of different practices have lot, lots of different strengths and weaknesses, but if we've got several practices within a region or a city, um, we try and make sure we get the complete and full mix and full offering of all the different dental modalities. Would you consider yourself a roll up or a roll out? And for my viewers, a roll up is when you're publicly traded, you go get a big line of credit and you go buy a lot of offices and roll them up and then add your uh, owning, operating, optimizing versus a roll out would be like you have a franchise, like say uh, McDonald's um, and you do de novos. You, you buy the land, the building, you start them from scratch. So of your 26 locations, how many of them were a roll up where you went out and acquired them versus a roll out where you started de novos from scratch? Yeah, um, exact numbers um, we've acquired more recently, so we're more a roll-up uh, model in recent times. We used to do a lot more de novos and roll-out. Pacific Smiles is, a, in Australia, the other listed dental group, is a roll-out model. So they just build their own. They used to acquire many years ago, but now for quite some years they have just been rolling out. Um, and de novo's greenfields, which we have done quite a lot of. So I think probably a, a, about a half of our practices are de novo or were de novo. We haven't done any in the last two or three or four years. We've uh, had varying supply and demand and government funding and different changes. It's been a, quite a dynamic dental industry in Australia in the last five or six years. They took a, one particular scheme of a billion dollars a year in government dental funding out, cut it, chopped it with three months' notice back at the end of 2012, which obviously for the a dental industry at the time that was worth five to six billion dollars, when you chop a billion dollars out of it, it suddenly <laughs> changed the face of dentistry and a lot of dentists weren't ready for it and didn't realise that it would change dentistry pretty much forever. And at the same time, we, were, we had four or five new dental schools opening. So we've been through some really interesting, again, supply and demand changes and dynamics in Australian dentistry. So we, at that stage, knew or foresaw, envisioned that uh, there'd be a lot of practices for sale, particularly the ones that had hurriedly been built and rolled up, of, you know, de novo during that last few years when the, the heyday of the billion dollar government spending was going on. So we, some of those are just not worth owning because if you haven't got a database of patients now post that 2012-13 era, so in the last four or five years, it's been very hard to, or more challenging to build a patient base uh, just because there's so much competition from those Halitian days pre-2012 and the five or six or seven years leading up to that. So we went away from de novos and um, have basically focused more on acquiring and expanding the existing filling facilities we've got. We always build and create a four, five, six, eight chair facilities. And obviously initially you only end up filling two or three of those surgeries. And then over time you have the scope to just add and double or almost triple the revenue and the services in some of those facilities. Do you generally like to own the real estate or are you not in the real estate business and prefer to lease? We only lease. In a, a few situations, which are disclosed in our annual reports, I or related parties or entities do own the, the real estate, but often it's the, the vending dentist sells. One Three Hundred Smiles does not own any real estate, so we are absolutely lessees, we occupy premises, we want to be flexible enough to move if if we need to or want to, but again, we'd rather buy and or set up in a good location, which again, you talk about, because location, location, location is important in dentistry and real estate. So we rather get the right venue, the right location, and um, then optimize it and run it well as a business, but not be a real estate play. So we're a business play, not a real estate play. You know, the dentist, they, you know, my, my book, Uncomplicate Business, you only manage people, time, and money. They don't, they don't like to do numbers. They like to do dentistry. They don't like to manage numbers. They don't listen to demographics. They believe if you build it, they will come. Um, 
you know, you see when dentists graduate in America and they go two hours away from a major airport, they crush it. And when they go downtown in these big major cities, it's very hard. But within a country, they don't understand supply and demand. I mean, Brazil has the same number of dentists as America, and America has a hundred million more people than Brazil. They have 200 million people. We have over 300 million people. And when I lecture down in Brazil, half the dentists have a part-time job. And I see that happening in India too with all these private schools. I mean, Malaysia, uh, we were lecturing at, what city were we in Malaysia? Kuala Lumpur. Lumpur. They went from one to six dental schools, one to six in five years. Australia doubled the number of dental schools in five years while giving about a thousand license uh, uh, permits to uh, Asian trained dentists. I mean, when you double your number, to, I mean, it's a perfect storm. When I was down there a couple of weeks ago lecturing in Melbourne and Sydney, every dentist come up to me and say, my God, they doubled the number of dental schools. They let in a thousand foreign trained dentists. And then we have corporate dentistry, expanded hours, better marketing, better location. It's just like the perfect storm. Uh, and America is doing the same thing. I mean, they, they've opened up six or seven new dental schools. I mean, it seems like every three to four months I see in a newspaper article um, where some other city or state is opening up a dental school. So that's really those supply and demand pressures is really going to have massive downward mm -hmm. pressures uh, on earnings in 2000. And um, I believe it was 2000. Uh, five Dennis, no, 2008, no, 2010 Dennis peaked out at 200. I, I forgot the number, but right now it, it's gone down basically 3,800 a year on average for the last 10 years. They're down to 174. So 174, uh, I think, I think they max out at 215 and, uh, and every year it's average going down about $3,800 a year. It's now down to 174 and I don't see any changing and those downward pressures on dentist earnings. Do you see that the same or differently? Howard, I, I love what you say. And yes, we are very aligned in a lot of the thinking and background there. I think one of the things we touched on the three A's before was affordability. I think, and that's, I'm going on record now, potentially globally to say, I think dentistry is far too expensive in this country and potentially the world. So unfortunately, statistically, 60 to 70% of the Australian population does not see a dentist on an annual basis. So if you talk about affordability, I don't think it's a government responsibility, but a third, give or take a third of our population has now got some sort of government healthcare card or entitlement card that supposedly allows them if the government dental facilities could cope with the numbers, but it does entitle them to free or a certain amount of dental care per annum. This is adults, children, and you know, geriatrics as well. So the whole gamut, a third, they can't cope with that. So they did have some outsourcing programs and different things that we were fairly instrumental in implementing and getting going, certainly in the state of Queensland, which was effective and reduced waiting lists for those government services from 12 months to up to seven years waiting lists. We reduced them now down to under six months across the state of Queensland and most of Australia has got this. But the average Australian, a third have government entitlement, at least a third have sort of nothing. They're in the, in the gap, in the mid, mid range where they can't afford it, supposedly. And then a third, you know, a bit under a third have private health insurance and at least some way of affording at least basic care and a subsidy off most of their treatment. But the, the, the concern I have is that 70% of the population don't get to see a dentist annually. And you and I know, we all know, listening, that that's just not acceptable and that most people do need at least annual maintenance, preventative, um, you know, scale and cleaning and, you know, often perio or other care and so how do we deliver that? So if with the supply and demand situation you, you spoke of, I absolutely agree, but somehow or other, we've got to try and make dentistry more affordable and accessible to the vast majority of the population who don't go even on an annual basis. You're also very passionate about this YWAM medical ships. 
Um, is that part of your corporate culture? Um, do you think that's um, a purpose-driven mission that helps pull your team together? How did how did you get into that? And what 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 does that mean to you though? Why W A M Medical Service? I watched the video. And what did you think? I, I I think it's amazing. I mean, you guys are down there and. Papua New Guinea. I want to give a big shout out to Henry Shine. You said in that video yeah. uh, that um, a man, um, that the Henry Shine head of the Asian division. Um, um, Gordon Anderson. Yep. Yeah, Gordon Anderson. Uh, I, I, I think we should put that. Uh, yeah, Gordon Anderson. Should Can we put that video at the end of your podcast too? Absolutely. Yep. Yeah, I think I thought. What is Y W A M? What is what is that? Yeah, Yam or Y Wham? It's it's pr- pronounced as it's short and an acronym for Youth with a Mission. So it's a global Youth Christ- with a Mission. Youth with a Mission. So in other words, it's a mission to basically go forth and help and do good throughout the world. It's a totally voluntary organisation uh, which just inspires me no end. So they have people. One of our dear friends there has just been 10 years as a full-time volunteer here in Townsville with YWAM, and she does all sorts of things in PNG, a local Christian radio station. They help in the community. They do all sorts of things. So it's a global organisation. I think they're in 160 of 186 countries or whatever the world. It's basically youth, but really youth is a very loose term. (laughs) But in general, it's youth somewhere around 18 to 30-odd years of age. Uh, I think it was founded originally in Hawaii and California, but now it's throughout, as I say, most of the world. So it's just young people with a Christian core to it, but you don't have to be any particular um, faith or belief. Um, but it's basically people who share common values, you know, generally biblical or Christian type values, to basically want to go forth and do good and help others uh, globally. And often they're in obviously very third world countries. Um, helping out and doing emergency aid or day-to-day care in schools and children and healthcare and you know all those sort of areas. So from my point of view, it really struck a chord with me when ten years, or oh, seven years ago, when the first ship was donated from New Zealand and South Pacific to YWAM in Townsville. Um, it struck a chord you know, to go out and it was had it and other ships have been operating in South Pacific around New Zealand, and Fiji and. Tonga and Samoa and all those places and the aim from Townsville then was to go up to our nearest neighbour, it's an hour and a half flight, actually nearer, Townsville to New Guinea is nearer than Townsville to Brisbane and the ship basically is based in Townsville but then goes for six and nine month outreaches and trips up to Papua New Guinea, our nearest neighbour and the island off the, the, the pointy tip of Australia sort of thing for some of your listeners who probably don't even know where PNG is. It's a very third world country, 7 million people. There's less than um, a hundred or a couple of hundred dentists in the country. So the stats and supply demand curve there are just off the chart. And one of the biggest problems is it's very hilly, it's very jungly, it's very wet. Um, There's highlands and lowlands. Jungle is 70 or 80 percent of the, the country. And basically there's little or no roads and access to a lot of the the rural and regional areas. So the only access is by dugout canoes and little boats and out, um, outboard devices. So we have a big ship, a medical ship in effect. Um, it's just expanded its capacity and just left Townsville a week ago with a final fundraiser where we raised a hundred odd thousand dollars to send it off again, um, equipped fully with a four chair dental facility on board and then five or six Zodiac tender ship boats motorboats outboards go out from the ship when it moors in a you know up a river or up a stream or off a coast somewhere off New Guinea and the many many islands and provides medical dental and optical care to the hundreds of thousands and in fact millions of New Guinea locals in very hard and to get at in remote areas so some of the dental care is extraordinarily urgent facial swellings toothaches abscesses stuff that is just not seen in a day-to-day American or Australian or whatever dental practice. I follow you on Twitter. Uh, you're at 1300smiles. Uh, you have two S's in that. Um, on, on Twitter, you're 1300smiles S. 
what's the second S for? Oh, that is that's one three hundred smile stadium. Oh uh, yeah. Yep. So does that um is that separate because I noticed all those posts at one three hundred smile stadium um and all the poster about the cowboys is that a separate uh twitter than your regular twitter or what what is that about again we broke new ground uh five years ago when we uh, took the initiative and thought it would be a great marketing and branding exercise to become the naming rights sponsor of one of the you know handful of national footy rugby league like your american football Stadiums and here in Townsville, we are very proud of our North Queensland Cowboys, which is the local team, not the Dallas Cowboys, but the North Queensland Cowboys. Uh, we're currently, tomorrow, in fact, playing in the semi finals to go into the grand final the following weekend. So, two years ago, we actually won the national competition and beat all the Sydney and Melbourne teams and some Brisbane teams. So, we're very much an outlier. But uh, we have a very strong culture and a very strong community support. So uh, we are the naming rights sponsor of the stadium, the home ground of the Cowboys. So it's been a phenomenal five-year ride. We've been, we won the grand final. We made the top eight and the final eight um, every year. We've been a sponsor of, or naming rights sponsor of the stadium, and our coverage and our reach and our brand has been off the charts from a success point of view. I rate it as my greatest, my greatest achievement in business to get dentistry, not just our company, but to get dentistry talked about around barbecues, around lounge rooms, around kitchens and in the paper and social media in this country. So it's part of my bid to try and get dentistry top of mind rather than other products and services. It seems like when I got out of school, it was yellow pages. Um, <laughs> mark, marketing has really gotten more difficult. What are you, what are you seeing today in marketing in 2017 that's working better now than say five or ten years ago? Are you, what, what, what are you doing to feed 26 locations a steady flow of new patients? You talk about um, sponsoring uh, your football team, uh, one 300 Smile Stadium. Has that been successful? Has that increased? Ever since you've done that, has that increased your new patient flow per location? Yeah, bear in mind it's not the footy team. The, the footy team plays in their home ground is that stadium, but it's a, we sponsor the stadium, not a footy team. So sponsoring sporting footy teams and sporting teams is a, a bit of a nebulous concept. But in terms of a naming right sponsorship of that stadium that has concerts, like Elton John has played there in the past and you know, various concerts, not enough, mind you, but concerts, other activities and various, you know, sporting and other bits and pieces are on there. It was also a soccer home ground as well at part of that time. So that has been a major branding and awareness, top of mind awareness thing, but as much corporately as it was for dental patients coming in per se, um, if Rugby league is very much an east coast of Australia, so the top of Queensland right down to, the, um, to Melbourne, but Melbourne is more Aussie rules football, as you know. So um, it's, you know, they don't understand rugby league down in Melbourne, but certainly Sydney is a, it's the home ground on the headquarters of the National Rugby League. So it's been great along the eastern seaboard where a majority of our practices are. But back to the major topic of marketing, I agree. It's become far more complicated the digital world and social media is just a, a beast that we all got to keep on top of and um, try and obviously prevent negative comments and optimize positive comments and feedback. Um, it obviously, to some extent, a large extent doesn't apply to whatever age group, but 60 plus year olds, because a lot of them aren't on it and in it and involved in it. So. You've got to keep more traditional mechanisms as well as the, the social media stuff. Um, I still can't get past word of mouth. I think the best the best marketing advertising is still doing a good job optimising that relationship as we talk about referrals, recommendations and recall sort of stuff and ongoing returning customer is the best one and we try and work on a concept of one patient referring five friends, family, friends or colleagues. Um, and a part of our model is, you, again, take away that back end and the complication and all of the, the other stuff and let the dentist and the nurse 
and the receptionist focus absolutely on the patient, the optimum care and service and um, compassion, and hopefully get the referrals from a good a job well done um, and looking after that patient so that they're happy and they go and tell a friend. What about practice management? In order to run 26 locations with uh, practice management, managerial accounting, financial accounting, are you running 26 locations with a piece of dental software that any other dentist could buy? Or is this proprietary software that you've developed for yourself? No, unfortunately, we are at the mercy of the handful of uh, dental software practice management software programs that are out there. So no, we and all the other corporates are uh, you know, using the mainstream type software. It's not as good as we'd like. And it's what are you, what are you using? A thing called Dental for Windows uh, by a company called Centaur. And, and, uh, and is it, does it have, a, uh, is it have accounting inside? No. Do you, no. do you find that bizarre that dentists <laughs> are trying to run a business without accounting software in their practice management system? It is just ridiculous. And it's been that way all the way along. And how many other business management systems do you have that doesn't do, you know, accounts receivable and payable and P and L? It's income and expense. Crazy. Um, you know, you're you're you buy your supplies from Henry Schein, correct? And amongst others, but yes. Yep. Yeah. And I, so I argued a lot with the CEO about this, Stan Bergman, who we're having on the show in a couple of weeks, and he listened to me. He's a great guy. I yeah. love Stan Bergman. You, you like missionary dentistry. Um, I, twice in my life, I've been in the middle of nowhere on a missionary dental trip and all of a sudden stumbled across a dental office in the middle of nowhere. And it was brought to you by Henry Shine. And I just, uh, I mean, I, a great guy. But anyway, so he listened. He flew an MBA from Shine all the way to Phoenix, listened to me rant for several hours, filled out a survey, mailed it to a thousand of their customers to see, is this something you want? And my own homies threw me under a bus and said, no. And then they said, well, what do you want? And I mean, it was stuff like changing the font size of their notes, being able to change it from black to fuchsia. I was reading <laughs> the feedback from Dennis and I thought, oh my God. They don't even know what they don't know. I mean, it is just crazy. But um, so, yeah, so that that is a weak spot. I wanted to ask you another thing. It's been in the news um, so many times just recently about Facebook and Google and Uber that basically the baby boomers, they got a job at General Motors when they were 16 and they retire when they were 65. My uncle got a job at Mobile Oil when he was 16. He retired when he was 65. Uh, same thing in Japan, you know, Toyota, Honda. But the millennials at Facebook, Google, um, you know, these great companies to work for, their average millennial only stays with them two years. And when I look at the, uh, corp the 35 corporate dental offices in America that have 50 or more locations, I, I mean, some of them only average a year, and the average is about two years. And it's, no, it's not any better amongst private practice. I mean, these kids come out of school. They get a job a year or two later. They just, I mean, they, they flip jobs like we used to flip hamburgers. Um, is that, do you see that in Australia too? What, what is your turn? You have a hundred dentists. Do you see, uh, what, what, is, what is your average turnover rate of dentists uh, with a hundred dentists in 26 location? How, how long do they average work for you uh, before they're off to their next best idea? How I don't know that stat offhand. It's certainly not you know, 12 months or two years in general. It's generally longer. We've got a lot of, you know, 5, 10, 15 year dentists, but we've also got, you know, a lot of new millennials who are only, you know, 6 and 12 and 18 months out of university. I think most of those, apart from the regional problem I touched on before, a lot of them do come regional to get out of the capital cities and to to find work literally in this country because in the capital cities it's next to impossible to get a, anywhere near a full-time job or they might work three or four day, day and a half jobs. So apart from ethnic and family drags and ties taking them back to the capital cities where often their, their family or their religious group or their whatever um, live, 
drag them back from the regions to the Brisbane, Sydney, Melbourne. That's a bit of a problem, but quite often now with practices in those cities and areas, we can you know just have an intra-company transfer and they can go from a regional area. We try and encourage them to stay at least a year or two regionally. A lot of them stay longer, um, but then you know they can come back to the capital cities and hopefully get a position in one of our practices in Brisbane or Sydney or Melbourne, well, not Melbourne yet, but or Adelaide. So it's really Brisbane or Sydney, the big East Coast practices in cities. So yeah, I think it's certainly a new a new challenge and the concept of five and 10 and 20 year dentists or staff, um, you know, again, we're talking dentists, but the same goes for the staff. There's, there's not gonna be a lot of loyalty or you know, there's gonna be a lot of mobility in those 17 to 25 year old dental assistants and receptionists and everyone else too. So. Well, a lot of a lot of people um, are making the observation from many countries I've been to that um, we the baby boomers were loyal to their company and they were loyal to their doctor. And I mean, you, go, you were talking about missionary dentistry. I mean, look at Christianity. You know, the the first three commandments are obey God, don't take His name in vain, um, um, honor the sa- honor the Sabbath. The fourth one's honor your parents. A lot of loyalty to company, to the dentist, to God. The millennials seem to be more loyal. In, instead of structural religion, they seem to be more spiritual. And they seem to be more millennial, to more um, loyal to themselves. So or, they, or their they, phone. <laughs> yeah. And so they see a dental office, they say, well, and plus they have, you know, they're young. So they haven't had extensive root canals and extractions and implants. So they, they've never seen uh, all that stuff. So so they just assume, well, all I ever get is cleanings, fillings, exams. I'm, I'm sure one 300 smile is a big brand. The dentistry is fine. So they don't really care about the dentist turnover. They're loyal to it's convenient, it's accessible, it's available, they have a payment plan. Um, they, I think the, um, I keep hearing in several countries that uh, I mean, I mean, look at these, look at these big public, look at these big dental offices in America that only keep their associate one or two years. They're still growing like gangbusters. Mm. But the old paradigm, well, if you're going to have a different dentist every every two years, no one's going to stay there. And it's like that's true if you're a baby boomer, but that's well, not true if you're a millennial. Do you see that observation in Australia? Absolutely. And I think it's being led, certainly in this country, by the medical profession. Like in the past, in our era of 45 to 60 plus year olds, you had your doctor and that's the doctor you saw and that's your doctor you took your children to and so forth. Now, again, the suburban medical practice has, certainly in this city and pretty much this country, have all been gobbled up and rolled up into a 5, 10, 20, 30 doctor medical precinct with, you know, pathology, radiology, you know, dietetics and physio and chiro and medical doctors galore. And if you can see your own doctor, great. But, you know, the next available is Dr. Blogs and you'll see them with little Johnny or little Mary's cough, cold, sore finger or, you know, bumped head or cut (laughs) laceration sort of thing. So I think the medical profession is dragging us down that, you know, your care and your health is very important, but need it now, which again is this philosophy, the next available, or the person you can see now or the next hour or this day or tomorrow is Dr. Bloggs, because your other doctor, your normal doctor is, is booked out or away on holidays for the next few days or a week or two weeks. Dentally, I think it's even more personal than medically, but I think the generation and this under 35, 40-ish vintage in the era, I think are far more willing and accepting to, we believe in the practice, goodwill and location and service and reputation. And if your personal family dentist isn't available, I think they're far more forgiving and understanding that they'll see you know, his associate or the other person, the other dentist or two, male or female, older or younger, hopefully we've got three, four, five options for them to be offered and they get to choose that person with the toothache or the breakage or the problem today if their own long-term dentist isn't available. So 
that's not our model per se, but it is obviously what happens if Dr. Bloggs is fully booked out or is away on holidays or is away on, you know, study leave or whatever. So, yes, I think it's changing. Is it for the better? Debatable. But if we can give people ongoing longevity of care and service in their own dentist, that's great. But I think, yeah, a lot of that younger generation are less worried about that as needing it now and getting it now. Do you agree? I, I ab- absolutely agree. Um, I can't believe we went over an hour. We're at an hour and three minutes, and then we're going to add two videos. I love your one three hundred smiles intro video, and I love the the uh, uh, what is it? Youth with, with a mission. Y W A M. I uh, you can follow them on Twitter at Y W A M Youth with a Mission. They have like nineteen thousand followers. That that's huge. Um, but I, but I want to ask you one final question and answer that, and then it'll be a wrap. Then we'll add these two videos. But uh, you and I uh, have done this for three decades. Uh, we have, you know, four children, five children. What advice would you give to the young dentists who just walked out of school and they just got out of dental kindergarten when we're going into the dental nursing home? Uh, what, <laughs> what advice would you give? the next generation of sovereign professional colleague dentists that are 25 years old and just walked out of dental kindergarten all baby fresh? A couple of tips. Find a mentor or several mentors, you know, at least one dentally or two, and one or two in life and other areas of interest. So have an interest and a mentor outside of dentistry. Look, listen, and learn, number two. You know, so look a lot, look at things, and listen to others, and take advice, and learn. Don't just think dental school taught you everything, because it didn't. Um, don't focus on the money. Focus on doing a bit more and uh, doing a better job and, you know, getting good referrals and building your business that way. If, if you don't focus on the money, ultimately the money comes. If you focus on quality and service, the money will come. Um, one of our core values is, you know, treat others like you'd like to be treated yourself. Or, you know, again, which is biblical on the commandments, do unto others as you have, have them do unto you. So, you know, treat others just like you treat yourself, your mum, your dad, or your wife, or your girlfriend, or boyfriend. Um, and, you know, set goals. You know, we talk about Clarity, focus, and execution. I've got a great mentor out of Dallas, Texas, Tony Jerry, the results guy. Um, and, you know, it's all about clarity. Be clear on where you're going, what you want, and you know, set goals and be definitive about it. Um, focus then on what you want in life, not just dentistry, but, you know, relationships and family and, you know, sport and recreation and health and well-being. And, um, and then execute, you know, the little word, the little word in the dictionary, do, D-O. <laughs> do it and uh, you know, the rest will come you know my uh, two oldest sisters went uh, into the Catholic nunnery straight out of high school and I, I was a disappointment to my mom because I didn't join the priesthood but you know what when you said treat other people like you want to be treated the reason they call that the golden rule because when you study every major religion from Hinduism, Judaism Buddhism, Confucius, Christianity Islam, that is the only sentence that's found in every major religion there's not another name of a person a place a city there is nothing there's not even a name of a town that shows up in every major religion and then in every religion it says treat other people like you wanted to be treated and that is why uh some of uh, the nuns and priests in my school thought that was why every major religion was praying to the same god because they said that was so plagiarism that was so exact that it was uh, some divine intervention. And my oldest sister believes that. My oldest sister believes that that, that that you just couldn't make that up in seven different places that many thousands of years ago. And the fact that it would be considered plagiarism in every university, she thinks that means they're all praying to the same God. But on that note, I just want to say you are a pioneer. You are a role model. Uh, when I'm down there... Um, in Sydney and Melbourne, everybody was taking notes on what you did. They all assume 
okay, this guy is running 26 offices. I'm running mine. I'm not going to reinvent the wheel. I'm going to study what this guy does in hours and convenience and marketing and product mix and pricing. I mean, my God, I don't think I ever had dinner or lunch with one dentist where your name didn't come up and they profoundly uh, respect you as a person, your integrity. They, they, you're just like, you're like Batman, Robin, and Superman all rolled up into one in Australia. And I want to thank you so much for giving me the honor uh, to come on the show. It's Friday, it's Thursday night at 6 p.m. on uh, November 21st, but it's already Friday morning at 11 o'clock there. I want to give a shout out to my brother Paul, who uh, moved from uh, America to Sydney. And now he's a full citizen there. It's his birthday today. He's 38 years old. I'm 55. He was uh, in a Catholic family. They didn't use birth control. So he was born when I was a senior in high school. Uh, and um, my God, Paul's a, just an amazing man. But uh, happy birthday to my brother. And uh, thank you, Daryl, so much for all that you've done for dentistry and for coming on the show today and talking to dentists around the world and giving them a hell of a lot to think about. My pleasure, Howard. Great to be part of it, and uh, thank you for your time also. Hi, I'm Dr. Darrell Holmes, and I would like to welcome you to 1300 Smiles. At 1300 Smiles, we care. We care about your oral health and the oral health of your whole family which is why we ensure that our entire team have the skills and understanding to provide comprehensive dental care to all generations. We care about your convenience. Our practices are open extended hours and the locations carefully selected to provide easy access and parking. At 1300 Smiles, we care about your dental options, which is why we have selected dentists with the skills to diagnose and provide you with all your dental needs, from your regular checkup and clean to full mouth rehabilitation, enhancing your smile through cosmetic dental techniques, to straightening your teeth through orthodontics and Invisalign, and in later life, replacing missing teeth with dental implants and implant retained dentures. Whatever your dental needs, our team will listen to your concerns, diagnose and assess your treatment needs, and present you with all your options. Not only do we care about your oral health, but we care about your overall health. Did you know that periodontal disease, or gum disease as it's often referred to, has been linked to heart disease? This is just one of many overall health issues that can be influenced by your oral health. Regular visits to your dentist at 1300 Smiles will not only help prevent avoidable dental treatments, but can assist with your general health. At 1300 Smiles, we understand the cost of dentistry can sometimes be a burden on you and your family, which is why not only do we work with all the major health funds, but we have also introduced our own payment programs. From just $1 a day, you can access regular dental visits plus discounts on any dental treatment you may need. And if you already require treatment, you can spread payments over time with our $99 a week program. These programs are part of our commitment to ensure that you and your family can access the dentistry you need when you need it. We deeply care about our patients and our team members, but more than this, we are committed to our overall social responsibility, which is why we are a major supporter of the Youth with a Mission Medical Ship provides dental, medical and optical assistance to remote areas of Papua New Guinea. We also provide thousands of Australians access to dentistry through our public-private partnering, helping reduce government dental waiting lists. Our aim is to provide as many people as possible access to outstanding dental care. Great dental care should not be for the privileged few, but for everyone. Thank you for taking the time to view this short introduction to our services. You will find additional videos about the treatments we provide, our flexible payment arrangements and our commitment to looking after your dental needs throughout this website. If you have any questions or would like to book an appointment, simply contact us now and we look forward to welcoming you to 1300 Smiles. Above all, 
we would like you to know at 1300 Smiles, we care about you. My name is Victor. I come from Papua New Guinea. I love my country. It is so beautiful and so diverse. We are known as the land of the unexpected, the least explored country on earth. We are made up of many different tribes, each with their own traditions. Me and my people live in villages. We live in high mountains, jungles, rivers and the coast. Though we have much beauty, we are facing very big healthcare challenges. Many of our women die in childbirth. We have one of the highest rates in the world. TB has been declared as a national emergency. Our children are dying of preventable and treatable diseases. Many of us will never see a dentist in our lifetime. Hundreds of thousands of people have low vision or no vision at all. Makasi had been blind for 10 years. Her and her family heard about the ship being in their area and paddled in their canoe for two weeks to see if there was anything that we could do for her eyesight. After a 45 minute operation, her sight was restored to perfect vision. She saw her three children for the very first time that day. She went from someone that was downcast, that had no hope in her face, to someone that had light in her eyes, someone that had hope and excitement for her future. It's so amazing what happens when the ship first comes into the village. All the men, the women, the children, they all gather along the, the shores and they start singing, start dancing. The ship is more than bringing health care. Um, it's, it's really bringing life and really giving them hope for the future. On board the ship we have a day surgery unit, a laboratory, dental clinic and lecture theatres which allows us to bring really specialised care right there to the people in the community and the villages. A helicopter will be on board which will allow us to do emergency transfers as well as to even reach further inland to some of those places that need specialist care. It is a partnership in the true sense in that it is helping to assist and support and promote uh, what is already contained uh, in our national health plan and uh, working very much in collaboration with the existing health system. The training element of the medical ship is very, very important. What that does, especially our health workers working in remote settings and those difficult settings, it empowers them, it strengthens them. It gives them that uh, someone does care. I've been involved now for over 30 years and it's been an incredible journey. I'm so grateful that we are able to align ourselves with the strategic plans of Papua New Guinea, working in not only public but private partnerships. And together, as we strengthen this nation, we are seeing some really good outcomes. My dream, I want to be a um, nurse. I want to help my people in this district and country. One of the things I love most about the work of the ship is seeing young Papua New Guineans engaged. Seeing young, passionate uh, Papua New Guineans from urban centres able to come out into the rural context of building their nation. When I think of the message I want to live, it's like me liking life. I want life and for you and for me, is to have life and live it to the fullest. We look despair in the eye and we say, you do not have the final word. We're people who have our fingerprints on a torch of hope. That's Papua New Guinean fingerprints, Australian fingerprints, fingerprints from all around the world that press forward because we want to live. So arise, holy sons of his land. Let us sing of our joys to be free. Papua New Guinea.